Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene. My name is James Trujillo. I am a cisgendered middle-aged man that is middle weight and middle height. I use he, him pronouns, and I am one of the two worship associates here to serve this morning. As many of you know, Reverend Jen is not in the pulpit today, so it takes two of us to help out. <laughs> if today is your first time with us, we'd love to get to know you. Our welcoming room is located in the south foyer, just right over there. There's some purple welcome uh, banners. It's a place for both long-time and first-time people to meet and chat. We also have handy guides to Sunday morning worship that tell you how to access today's order of service, what the low stimulation room is, and so much more. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand and someone will bring one to you right now. If you haven't noticed, we're in the middle of our annual pledge drive for 2024-25. The pledges represent part of our promise to live our values. The pledges we are making now are for the year that starts on July 1st. I know a lot of us are on auto pay for our contributions and those will keep going unless you tell us to stop. But we're asking everyone to pick up a pledge envelope. They're sitting right over there. It's hard to miss them. And to consider increasing your contribution this year if you are able to do so. In a few weeks, we're going to send out stamps on those envelopes and mail them out. So if you can help us save on the postage and pick up your envelopes today, that would be fantastic. I do have an update on our numbers. Could I get a drum roll, please? Thank you very much. Our goal is 585,000 and we have now collected 314,554. Thank you very much. I have one quick announcement for everyone. Our small group connection circle, SGCC, is organizing a pet food drive right now. Please help us stock the pantry. We accept donations of cat or food, dog or food, dog food, dry or wet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, new or, this was just handed to me. So new or pet, uh, <laughs> please make sure all rejected food is tightly resealed. Donations may be left in the white donation bin in the church hallway or be brought to the Trillium Produce Plus on the first and third Thursday each month from 2 to 4 p.m. Thank you for your generous donations. And if you have any questions, please contact Patricia Ryder or Daniel Blades. And today we have Emily Sissel from the Generosity Network who has a quick announcement for all of us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily and my teammates on the Generosity Network, Janelle, Judy, Mary Beth, and Linda wanted to let you guys know who in the world we are and what we do. So we are the Generosity Network, sometimes called GenMet, and our goal, our mission is to host fun raising events for the church, which as you can imagine are events that are primarily to support our budget while also building community and having fun. So you might have had uh, fun at the Sweethearts Ball, that was us hosting that. Uh, upcoming events are our Across the Universe uh, auction in, uh, on May 4th and the Pi Day on Friday, March 15th. So. That is what we do. We are looking for more members to join our team. So if you're someone who likes to plan fun events, uh, come see our table out in the hallway after service. And I can talk to you more about what we do and when we meet. And may the fourth be with you. And you with us on May 4th. And don't be afraid of the Ides of March. Come here and have pie and do circle things. Thank you. Now let us enter our worship time by lighting the chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. <laughs> the flame in this chalice will not stay lit. In the human record, there have been times of cold and darkness 
And there is ab abundant evidence that such a time approaches us now. But as we relight this chalice, we are reminded that the human spirit has always found its way out of the cold and darkness. And now let's say together the words of our mission, which affirm our shared purpose. Empowered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. My name is Ryan Doppelmeyer. My pronouns are she, her. I am a middle-aged, middle-sized white woman with some black pants and a beaver shirt on, which is, I must say, not my usual attire, but we're going to go with it this morning. Go orange. Go beavers. And I'm going to invite anyone who'd like to come and have a little conversation with me about a little friend of mine to come on up. If you're five or you're 50, come on down. We're going to chat about a little visitor that I have with me today. Our Sunday today, the grown-ups are going to be talking about pretty important stuff around earth justice. And so I, thank you, my darling child, <laughs> wanted to chat with you and tell you the story of a creature who can kind of remind us how connected we all are, how our whole, whole world is a web where if you touch something, one thing, it affects other things down the line. It's kind of amazing. It's kind of magical, actually, how we're all connected together, which means... We have to take care of each other, ourselves, our planet, the animals that live here on this planet, like this guy right here. Hello. Oh, what is this guy? A beaver. A beaver. We are in the beaver state. Did you know that? Yeah. Oregon is known as the beaver state. Yeah. Because years and years and years ago, there were these guys all over the place. So many beavers. You couldn't believe how many. And oh my goodness, they're so cute, aren't they? And they're so soft. And they're so soft that it was kind of a problem for them, right? Because settlers came and thought, oh my word, what a fantastic hat that would make. Oh, fantastic. What a beautiful cape that beaver would make for me. And they were hunted and hunted and hunted and hunted and hunted until they were almost extinct here. Oh no. Yeah. Which is a big problem for us too, right? Even if you don't think a beaver is cute, they do pretty important jobs. So beavers, you know, create dams and affect the waterways. And by hunting them, by building our own big dams and messing with their environment, we've kind of caused some problems as people living here in Oregon, right? So the beavers and what they do to create wetlands, they help protect our forests from forest fires by keeping a damper environment. They also help other species, help fish particularly, right? Because they create environments for young fish to, to grow, for older fish to spawn. And so when those environments aren't around, other species are in danger too. Man, we all go together so closely. We really gotta pay attention. So there is some good news though, okay? Folks are starting to get smart and led by indigenous folks who knew this stuff already. We're trying to bring the beavers back. We are introducing them along the river. We're leaving them alone and trying not to hunt them and letting them build their own dams to help the salmon, to help other fish too. And they're starting to make a comeback. So I'm here to let you know, oh, we are so connected. We have to be aware of that. 
And man, sometimes things look pretty bleak, right? Like things did for the beavers not so long ago. But if we pay attention and we learn and we really realize how connected we are, we can turn things around and we can help our world. Okay. Good morning. My name is Augie Sabini. I use the he, him pronouns. And for those who can't see me, picture a short, balding, gray-bearded man wearing a green plaid shirt in memory of the irrepressible Eileen Aides amens. And insist, really, she said amen, didn't she? <laughs> and insistence that we dance. The great turning is a phrase first used in the 1980s to describe a global shift in human consciousness. It goes by many names, as described by scientists or spiritualists, botanists and Buddhists, prophets and poets. I wonder, is it a coincidence that this idea arose at the same time that CO2 levels and global surface temperatures started to go up at alarming rates? After 5,000 years of empires, we are moving into a new epoch of human awakening, an epic shift from an era of separation to an era of interconnection, a spiritual evolution that is leading us away from relationships based on domination to relationships of mutual care and accountability. A transition from the industrial growth society to a life-sustaining civilization. We see signs of this great turning in every global movement, from the women's rights movement to gender justice, indigenous wisdom, compassion, the regenerative economy, permaculture, interpath spiritual easy for you to say, interpath spirituality, biomimicry and design. And the list goes on and on. For those of us who feel anxious, fearful, angry, or hopeless about the state of the world, may today's service remind you of our collective power to support the flourishing of life. Good Sunday morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Jen Young Sun Ru. I use the pronoun she and her, and I'm recording this message for you on Friday as I leave town to spend the weekend at a social forestry camp. As a newcomer to the Pacific Northwest, I really want to build a relationship with the land here, especially with its forests. I also want to like, re-educate myself and shift my perspective because I know that for most of my life I've been living with a typical American mindset as it relates to nature. And what I mean by this is that I feel gratitude for the plants and the animals and the waters that nourish my body. I like to garden and hike in nature and kayak. I recycle, but you know, something has been calling to me, calling to me to become uncivilized and to reclaim what my ancestors knew about their place on this earth. And so I'm spending the weekend listening to the trees. I'll be back next week and I hope to see you then. 
The kingfisher rises out of the black wave like a blue flower. In his beak, he carries a silver leaf. I think this is the prettiest world, so long as you don't mind a little dying. How could there be a day in your whole life that doesn't have its splash of happiness? The world of poetry and prose abounds with scenes like this one from Mary Oliver, capturing our love of the natural world. Paintings and photographs, too, somehow convey that feeling of awe and startling beauty. An early night sky, the color of peach fuzz, the pink of a crabapple flower, the splashing waters of a springtime creek, a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. And yet, centuries of art exalting the land, sky, the sea, and its more than human creatures have not stopped us from destroying this one and only earth. Our appetite for more, bigger, faster, has reduced this living, breathing planet to an object, separate from our own bodies, separate from our own nature. We want strawberries in winter and new phones every few years. We want air conditioning in the desert, cheap steaks, cheap clothes, and we do not want to think about where our waste goes. And I'm right there. I'm right there in the middle of it too. And we're, here we are facing the result of our actions, widespread ecological damage. You know what's going on. Last year, 2023, was the hottest year on record, period. Temperatures have been rising for the last 40 years. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have never been as high as they are now. And the poor quality of the air is killing millions of people around the world. In the last 50 years, humans have been consuming more of the Earth's resources than it can naturally replenish. More than 500 animal species will most likely be lost in the next 20 years, something that would have taken thousands of years without human destruction. We're cutting down forests at an alarming rate to clear land for large-scale agriculture. Arctic ice is melting and sea levels are rising forcing people and animals to find higher ground. Every living thing is suffering. People who are the least responsible for climate change are the ones who are the most impacted. Knowing that this is the state of our world and seeing little change causes us to feel scared and anxious overwhelmed and panicked. We feel guilt, grief, anger, betrayal. So many of us are feeling like this, that a climate mental health network has been established. I've included a link in the order of service. They have some very good resources, so I hope you check it out. If you are feeling these things as I am, you are definitely not alone. And it's really quite a natural response to the state of our world. I hope that you know that we're holding a workshop this Saturday, March 2nd, on the emotional impacts of climate change. Um, just look on the front page of our website for more details. And I think there should also be a poster on the bulletin board back there. So how do we, as a people of faith, 
cope with the enormity of these problems? Well, let me, let me offer you three things this morning. One is to join with others. Don't do this alone. Join the Earth Action Team here at UUCE. There you'll find connections with local activists and the Unitarian Universalist Association's excellent network. Number two, make a personal commitment, a vow, if you will. Choose to use your life's energy to support the flourishing of life and to be part of the great turning. As Augie said earlier, whatever activity or collective movement that helps us to move away from relationships based on domination, toward relationships of mutual care and accountability, that is the work that we need every single person to be a part of. Dr. Joanna Macy describes herself as a scholar of Buddhism, systems thinking, and deep ecology. She suggests to us a set of five vows. And if you're interested in taking these vows yourself, you can find them today um, in today's order of service. I vow to myself and to each of you to commit myself daily to the healing of our world and the welfare of all beings. To live on earth more lightly and less violently in the food, products, and energy I consume. To draw strength and guidance from the living earth, the ancestors, the future beings, and all my kin of all species. To support each other in our work for the world and to ask for help when I feel the need. And finally, to pursue a daily practice that clarifies my mind, strengthens my heart, and supports me in observing these vows. The third way that we can cope with the climate crisis is to commit to being a community of resilient, hope-activated people. Joanna Macy has been an environmental activist for 60 years. Now, at the age of 94, she focuses on resilience and something she calls active hope. Active hope is not wishful thinking, she writes. Active hope is a readiness to discover the strengths in ourselves and in others. A readiness to discover the size and strength of our hearts, our quickness of mind, and steadiness of purpose. She invites us to begin by noticing both the beauty and the suffering of the world, the awesomeness of life and the crisis we are facing. This means we are called to use our inner strength to face rather than to turn away from. I know, I know how easy it is to feel overwhelmed and checked out. I know that many of us have disengaged because it just all feels like too much and our efforts feel like too little. But every little thing does matter, including the subtle shifts in our consciousness and changes to our worldview. It matters, writes David Abram, when we start to notice and experience our immersion in the invisible air, to start to recall what it is to be fully part of this world. Then 
this breathing landscape is no longer just a passive backdrop against which human history unfolds, but a potentialized field of intelligence in which our actions participate. That last line reminds me of a Rilke poem. If we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. Instead, we entangle ourselves in knots of our own making and struggle lonely and confused. If we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. You know, even if every person surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we may still not be able to stop the climate crisis. But the practices of active hope and strengthening our own resilience and that of our communities will help us to face these threats in the spirit of love and cooperation rather than fear and hostility. No one knows what our future holds, but today, today, we can choose to support the flourishing of life for all beings. We can rise up rooted like trees. May it be ever so. Amen. Let's say our closing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As you go, please take a few minutes to greet your neighbors, especially those you don't know yet. And if you need a conversation starter, feel free to share your favorite cheesy TV show. <laughs> and now, if here you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world. <laughs>